that leads to violence. Every human being is entitled to all the rights that are in the Constitution, and no one is criminal on sight. We will be uh, tabling hate crimes legislation, which is, seems to be an important mechanism from a number of countries. And it's, there is a hate crimes uh, working group, which seems to be of civil society, which seems to be comprised of a wide range of, of interests from LGBTI organizations. It's a partnership between government and civil society. And if there are problems, those problems should be raised in the national task team. We've had all these presentations. I would now invite you all and open the floor to questions and comments on how best we could use national human rights systems and regional human rights systems in combating violence on the basis of SOGI. You see, once you get to this point, you have opened a dialogue and now you have to talk. And, and this is basically how you progress. And you start at a point where you don't understand each other. But as you talk, you begin to see my point because I'm explaining to you and you're able to walk in my shoes. How um, are we going to take this conversation forward in our individual countries as civil societies if we do not have our government representatives here? We see commissioner here, but then there are other parastatals, there are other steps, levels of government who need to be engaged apart from civil society. So I'd like to suggest that as a collective, we intensely mobilize the active and uh, continued involvement of the faith-based community in this journey in educating their congr congregants and audiences on gender identity and expression. For me, the faith-based sector is largely absent in groundwork and yet forever present in the growth of discrimination towards LGBTI and MSM people in our society. The faith-based sector must wholeheartedly be involved in securing human rights and at some stage be held accountable for the continued uh, violation of human rights when they speak out from their pulpits. Thank you. Do we have any guidance speaking to uh, working on these issues, looking at the, the use of vernacular languages within the context? Because we, it's easy to speak about sexual orientation and gender identity in lesbian and gay and bisexual and transgender and vagina and anus and penis in English. It's very difficult to speak to these issues in our native languages. Do we have any guidance around how we work around our languaging, uh, speaking to the issue? Thank you. We did get to a point where we questioned whether using a name other than lesbian made political sense. And the reason why we stuck with it was because of the big resistance to lesbian and the meaning of lesbian. So it was a kind of a political decision but I think the conversation needs to be ongoing and we need to grapple with this because I think some of the barriers that we face are often almost purely linguistic. The resistance often and the hostilities often is, is purely, not always, I mean often it is, you know, the hostilities coming from a deeper, a deeper place, but I think that is an important question and I hope we can make time in the next few days to um, to continue that conversation. What I was trying to do is in, in terms of the South African experience was, was sort of raising the importance of lobbying, uh, lobbying influential people, that this kind of struggle I don't think is going to be won by a majority vote of the population. And any, any rights-based struggle, generally why um, human rights gets put in, get put into a Bill of Rights in the Constitution is to protect the vulnerable. The resistance is huge. So we can sit here and talk, but until and unless we come up with a strategy on how we're going to open a little space for dialogue in Addis Ababa, we're not going to go far because as is now in Addis Ababa, the, the decision is there is no need for dialogue. It will not take place today, tomorrow, or ever. So I'm saying ECOSOC, which is a body through which civil society participate in Addis Ababa. You have to say how are you going to use ECOSOC to open that space. The issue of LGBTI, we must keep talking about it. In Kenya, they say you may not like it, but you've heard. 
governments are hearing. The African Commission has spoken. It's a start. In the case of Tunisia, it was noted that after the revolution, there were gross arrest and detention of individuals on the basis of sexual orientation. Even anal tests were performed by police officers on detainees on the basis of sexual orientation. We must invest more time and more thinking in how to capacitate our judiciaries uh, to come to the table where we can use litigation to open up opportunities and also use litigation to teach. A lot of other constitution, including the Namibian one, does not have a specific provision on sexual orientation, and that has often been used to not um, directly, as it were, provide for rights of LGBTI communities. You know, most of the people that are sitting, are occupying um, the spaces and positions of decision making in our countries, don't have any sensitization or any understanding and appreciation of SOGI, the rights related to SOGI. It's a question of being accommodative, being patient, and learn, I mean, trying our, our best to bring them on board. I'll be interested to hear from the panelists and other commissions here what they are doing practically. Um, I think this meeting is about practical solutions and uh, I worry that we're spending too much time on theories and things in the books rather than things that are actually happening at institutional level. What are we doing to hold politicians accountable? No, you know you have to come to us. We don't know who you are. As Mr. Trau will say, we are with you. Come to us and this, let's discuss. I know I know people from Burkina Faso. I know we are in a secrecy. We're working together in a good collaboration. You need courage. You 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 you, you need to, to you need to go to those commissions. So we are there to defend you in this endeavor. You know, if you, we we approach it, we do. We've we spoke. We've spoken with MPs, and we can do that. You have to assist us, and we will support you too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Celestine. I want to just make two remarks quickly. One is that, and, and I think many of us are, 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 are responsible for dividing struggles, including people in the so-called LGBTIQAXYZ community. We, and, and I think that it's coming out of your presentations that this struggle is some other struggle. It's another struggle. It's not the actual real struggle. There is only one struggle, and that is about social justice for every living human being. <laughs> that is the struggle. And the rights of somebody, myself, who has same-sex desire, is not different to the rights of a woman to wear a miniskirt and stand at a taxi rank and be allowed to stand there in her miniskirt, because that is her body. It is not different to the rights of a woman who has fallen pregnant and for whatever reasons, she should not be giving birth to that child to have an abortion. These are not different rights. They, it's one set of rights. And it's about bodily integrity and the autonomy of persons, of human beings. It is only one struggle. The, the, the second point I want to make is we are sitting here as people who are non-conforming. I'm not calling us LGBTIQA. We are non-conforming to the social standard. And you guys, we need you. We don't need you to be followers of the ideas of our ancestors and the society that is slow or not ready, we need you to lead and set the standards, that's what you are for. You are a standard setting institution. You are not followers. And if you don't do that, you are leaving us to the hostilities, the attacks, the murder. When you heard people talk yesterday, you are leaving us to the mercy of our hostile states and the hostile laws. We are asking you, we are telling you that we are on our own 
if you are not with us and we expect you to lead and set the standards because we are dying. We're not asking communities to say we love what you're doing. We believe in what you are doing. We are saying keep your beliefs. We understand everybody has belief systems. We understand you think this is vile. You think this is un-African, unholy. Good. But we are human. Can you stop killing us? Can you stop torturing us? Can you stop raping us? Can you stop forcing out us out of our homes, out of our jobs, out of our communities, and out of our churches? Can you stop? And that must be an okay thing to say. That must be okay. So we're not asking you to ask communities to hurry up and believe this is okay. We're saying, please, can you stop killing us? Government agencies have felt like they are doing the LGBTI uh, movement and family a favor, uh, being invited, being given the opportunity to, to speak at such forums. And you'll always find that uh, when mainstream issues are being discussed, it's, uh, let, let us put the LGBTI conversation on the sideline because we don't want to upset anybody. It's important to distinguish issues as far as I'm concerned. Uh, when we are protecting the rights, we protect the rights of everybody. There is issue of discrimination. There is issue of health. You cannot uh, say or not protect these people when it comes to this issue. I have to believe that some of the questions and some of the things that have been said must be sparking something. And that's something I hope is discomfort. And I think there's a danger when we become so diplomatic that we don't create enough discomfort to force a process of, 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 of stronger consciousness. And if we can't create that discomfort and start and, and trigger new change threads, almost like a whole lot of threads and chains, that are, if we can't start those kinds of chains and threads with the people in this room, then we're in trouble, you know. So we've got to stay hopeful. We've got to, we've got to keep questioning, asking those hard questions, remain respectful, but also show strength and that we respect ourselves. Like, if nobody else respects us, we are going to respect ourselves. As here, we are all here, we have come here to learn. And I'm telling you that we are going to take necessary steps to make sure that we are going to work on everything that has been discussed here. Thank you. I'm also wanting to, to stay positive and to, to have a, a, like a strong sense of anticipation and expectation that the dialogue has started in a more formal way and that this is, it can't just be an event, like a one-off sort of thing. This has got to be the beginning of a process, right? It's got to go somewhere. So in six months' time, we need to be back in the formal space. But what happens between now and that next six-month space when we come together, maybe with more governments and so on, what is the agenda now? And so I'm really hoping that, even if it's in small ways, that people are really, like he said, taking things out of this. and. It's food for thought. And you know, I really strongly believe in, in those sort of powerful, those thoughts that, are, that, that provoke consciousness. During the apartheid era, as Africans, we all came together and, fight and fought the common enemy. And therefore, why is it now that when we've got this LGBTI, we are not coming together? That's a question that came out very pertinently. And for me, it calls for strategies that we as NHRIs, LGBTI, even supporters from within government must follow in order to effectively address the, this scourge of violence against LGBTI in particular at this particular stage. So all I'm saying is that we need each other. Uh, whether we need to move slow or faster, it depends in which country you find yourself. It may be easy in the one country to move as fast as you can. In others, you can move as fast as your law allows you to do. We know of human rights defenders within NHRIs who have been killed. So there are different dynamics, but it's just something that we have to consider. Thank you. With the pre-conference, there's been a declaration that's, uh, 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 that came out of that, and we're hopeful that at the end of this meeting, 
These states represented here as civil society, as government officials, as national human rights institutions, we leave this place saying this one thing we commit to, to go back to our country and do this one thing. And it will be something that all of us can leave this space with, um, that we'll be able to hold us accountable to, but also be able to do further advocacy around. The question that we had was whether this is a declaration, are we declaring uh, something at the end of it? So that's a question that maybe after we've looked at the content of the draft, we may have to answer by saying maybe this is the name, that sounds better. The <coughs> name of the declaration is really based on the name of the seminar, which is about finding practical solutions on ending violence and discrimination against persons based on sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. That's the introduction paragraph that uh, this is who we are in the rooms, government officials, national human rights institutions, and civil society representatives. Of course, uh, the dates and uh, venue. They are now trying to adopt the declaration. Uh, it will be an in principle adoption because we still have to make some amendments to the test. But um, it all came together in the end, so uh, we are quite happy. And Resolution 275 has a life. And all thanks to the African Commission, really, for beginning this process that has enabled us to have this dialogue. And there's really quite a number of practical solutions that have been placed on the table, and the declaration really speaks to that. So forward is the only way. It's amazing. Whatever our concerns, it's just amazing to see words put to the ideas and the experiences and the analysis, like to see it up there in like clear words, succinct and just the power of it, it's, it's amazing. This is good. The declaration, although it's in draft, it's something that we can take forward, work on it, and we, from an organization point of view, can implement these things on ground level. It is a beginning, but it looks like it's a beginning of something that is definitely going to be a lot more um, inspiring um, and a lot more in-depth in terms of the way that we're looking at doing policy work around um, making 275 real. There's a sense of accomplishment, there's a sense of relief, and there's also a sense of nervousness, um, simply because it has taken so long and so many people, and we've lost a couple of soldiers along the way um, in getting to this point. Um, the nervousness is then the next steps. Where do we take the declaration? Where do we take the recommendations that have been made today? The recommendations that have been made in the last few days from the pre-conference to this very day. People might not understand what this means. That for the first time on this continent, we have a document of the African Union with all the rhetoric around this issue. To have uh, commissioners speak this publicly about the obligation of states.